Um, thank you for joining us for our, our, was it, our, our May event. Um, and you, yeah, um, joining us for our deep learning um, tu uh, tutorial slash workshop uh, with Mark Cohen from Google. Um, apologies if you hear drilling behind me because that's because the people next door are drilling. So it's an exciting glimpse into uh, into life in lockdown. If you want to get in contact with us, you can get in contact with, with us through all the usual channels on Twitter at PyData MCR. You can join the Slack um, at uh, PyData uh, UK uh, Slack. And of course, listen to our podcast at PyData Podcast. Um, your volunteers and code of conduct response team, um, Joe, uh, Joe Allen, who's doing the streaming today, um, myself, um, and Jennifer and Sean, who are behind the scenes um, in the chat and on the Twitters and in the comments of the YouTubes, all the places. Um, any issues, speak to any of us. Um, you can find us. All of our Twitter contact details are in the PyData Manchester um, Twitter description, so you can get in contact with us there. We've got um, a, we've got a code of conduct that it's important that everyone abides by, um, even during um, during lockdown, when we we do the on um, while we're doing the online events. Um, so try try our best to be inclusive. Um, PyData is a professional environment, so let's treat it as such and be friendly, but still professional. Any issues, we've got um, the anonymous support form right there. Um, got some upcoming events, of course. Um, next Wednesday, um, I believe June 3rd, it's our code night. Um, Open Data Manchester and Herplus Data um, are running a joint event. So two friends of uh, two friends of PyData and Manchester running an event together. Python Northwest um, as well. Um, at the end of the month, we'll be running um, a hyperparameter tuning workshop as well. And uh, we still need to sort out the dates of that. And I believe on the 27th of June, although I can't remember the exact date, I think that's it. And um, we'll have the next PyData UK, although um, this will this time going to be organized by uh, PyData Cambridge and the team down there. So as I mentioned, um, we've got our um, our recent podcasts. Um, our interview with Hera Hussein from Open Contracting um, came out yesterday or today and um, but it was fantastic fun recording it and it should be fantastic to listen to as well so i encourage you to all to go and have a listen to it um any announcements if you're looking for a job if you've got a job any kind of data job um post it in the in the slack channel um hashtag jobs inventively um if you want to get involved as a as, um, be it as a speaker um on the podcast if you want to sponsor us if you want to help us with venues uh, when it comes back to having real life physical things um, or being involved with the Code of Conduct response team or for any feedback for the Code of Conduct response team, please get in touch. Um, Twitter, Meetup, um, in the Slack, and we've got a speaker form as well, which I think is on Twitter. So tonight uh, we've got Mark, Mark Cohen um, from Google. Um, who's going to be talking us through um, a little bit of an introduction to machine learning and some background to data science and um, before walking us through a deep learning, uh, I suppose, workshop. And um, if you've got any questions for Mark, then you can go on the Slido, um, use the event code 55578. Um, and then at the end, of, um, partway through this session, um, I'll be posing your questions to Mark. Um, so any, any anything you don't understand or you want to clear up, pop it in the Slido or pop it into the Slack channel um, and see if the community can help you overall. I um, want to thank our, um, our sponsors, Horsefly Analytics, uh, Cathcart Associates, um, Num Focus, and Google Developers. Um, without, without them all, um, PyData wouldn't be possible. Um, and especially without Num Focus, um, a lot of the open source code we use wouldn't be possible either. Um, for um, after the after the event, um, there'll be, as usual, conversation in the Slack channel. Um, so get involved. Um, and again, feel free to contact us. So we'll be going over to Mark. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, John. Um, I will share my screen in a second. As uh, John said, uh, my name's Mark Cohen, and uh, I am a cloud developer advocate at Google. Um, I think you're still presenting, John. Sorry. It's okay. 
<laughs> um, so my job is basically to help people take advantage of Google Cloud. And uh, today I'm going to focus on some of the machine learning capabilities, although actually more than the Google Cloud, I want to focus on sort of the basic building blocks of machine learning. Um, let me share my slides now and we'll give you a better sense of what we'll cover. So hopefully everyone's seeing a big slide that says machine learning and the Google Cloud. And uh, yell at me if you don't see it. So um, thanks for joining me tonight. Um, the slides that you see that I'm presenting are available online at mco.fyi. It's this link in the lower right, mco.fyi slash mltalk. So feel free to go there now or anytime after the talk if you want to review these slides. Um, that's me. I have a Twitter, I have email, I have a blog, like everyone. Uh, and so if you don't get a chance to ask something and I can help you, feel free to reach out to me at any of those um, venues. Um, what I wanted to accomplish today is to just make sure, bring everybody up to speed so that you know what ML is about um, and how to get some actual experience building a neural net as well as some ideas about solving machine learning problems in the cloud. The, um, the middle item is where we'll actually do a lab, like a hands-on uh, workshop together. I don't know how that's gonna go because I can't see any of you and uh, it may be tricky getting feedback on, on a, your pro progress or, or whatnot, but feel free to submit questions as we do it and uh, we'll see how it goes. The key is I, I really want you to get a feeling not just of the theory, but of the practical, actually how to build a, a neural network yourself. And that's what we'll focus on in the, in the hands-on portion. So let's start with some foundational items. Uh, I'll probably go through this section pretty quickly because I suspect many of you already know a good bit about machine learning, maybe more than I do. So uh, this is really just to get everybody onto the same page. I like this example because it's normally written, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And I often ask people uh, what's wrong with it. And almost all native English speakers will immediately say it's quick brown, brown quick sounds wrong. And the reason is something that very few people are able to tell me. It turns out the answer of why that sounds wrong is that there are these rules about the order in which you need to arrange adjectives in English. Um, and so quick is a quality and brown is a color. So that's why we say quick brown and not brown quick. Almost no one knows this, but in a sense, everyone knows it because uh, you've integrated these ideas so deeply in your language learning process that you can immediately tell that brown quick sounds wrong but you're not really aware of the rules that you're applying. And I think that's a great metaphor for machine learning. It's the idea of understanding rules by exposing yourself or your software more likely to data. Um, so, so yeah, that's an example that I like to use to explain that machine learning really is all about learning from rules plus experience. So there are rules involved, but the experiential part is really the key somewhat like how we learn chess. We learn how the pieces move and then we play a whole lot of games to get, get better at the game. So this idea is really fundamental. It was first written, well, as first of my, to my knowledge was written about uh, in 1950 by Alan Turing, who said, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not try to produce one which simulates the child's? So the idea has been around for a while. Why did it suddenly take off? Why has it, have we seen this sudden surge of interest? And I want to argue that uh, it's a function of a bunch of things that have come together roughly in, in, or have culminated in around the same time. One is hardware improvements. That's not something that's suddenly happened. That's been going on for decades. Are you coming up? In a thousand computers, you can actually get access to them at a not unreasonable price for an hour or a day or whatever time you need and do that kind of computing. You just couldn't do that sort of thing in the past. Uh, there's a lot more data available. I like to tell 
people, especially young people that, uh, you know, no one in history has ever had as much access right at their fingertips to more data than you have right now. And that's uh, quite an enabling thing for you if you're interested in doing data science. Uh, the, the open source movement has been huge. A lot of times you'll see innovations published and the papers will have a, a link to a GitHub repo where you can download the code and try it yourself. And of course, lots of interesting research and refined techniques have, have been coming along. And these sort of feed on each other, right? The, the, the more computing you have, the more you, things you can try, the faster your experimentation loop goes, the more you can develop new, new data and the more uh, new techniques rather. And then the more data you have available, the more interesting things you can do. So it sort of all comes together in a kind of a perfect storm. Uh, Google has seen this growth quite uh, on a sort of an exponential curve. It's now the case that pretty much every product at Google is using machine learning in a fundamental way, not just as a kind of a, a side feature, but an essential core feature. The graph you're looking at here is a uh, count of the number of project directories in the Google mono repo, which have TensorFlow machine learning models. And this is actually not too, not too recent. I need to refresh this, but um, the curve is exponential and it models a lot of other things we're seeing where we're seeing exponential growth and in interest in this technology. This diagram is, or chart rather, is the, uh, the growth in the number of new papers in archive on machine learning. So um, it's not just Google, obviously, it's an industry-wide and really a worldwide academic phenomenon as well as industrial. Uh, this is a great paper. A lot of the slides in this talk are clickable, so you can click through this image to get to this article. Um, it's a New York Times article which uh, gave a really nice inside view of how this uh, developed and how it transformed the industry from the perspective of Google Translate. So I highly recommend that for background reading. Um, I'm not going to go through the litany of, you know, breakthroughs and interesting uh, developments we've seen over the last uh, decade or so, um, other than just to highlight one example, which I find interesting. So this was um, some work that was done to apply deep learning networks to retinal images. And one of the interesting things that came out of this study was they found uh, after the fact that they were able to use these images to predict cardiovascular risk. So more general circulatory uh, health by examining the, the circulation in your, ret in your retina. And what I find really intriguing about this was they didn't set out to, to look for this result. This was simply a byproduct of something, you know, something they know, serendipity, they noticed uh, when they were looking for other things, that they had this correlation and they found this to be a very useful way to, to diagnose uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, so that's just a, a, a quick, quick background. Um, I do want to go over a few uh, other concepts that are broader than, than deep learning. Uh, these three terms I like to clarify just because they're sometimes used interchangeably and different people have different uh, ways of defining them. For visual intelligence is the entire subject of trying to model and simulate uh, useful behavior artificially, uh, oftentimes human-like behavior, but um, machine learning is going down a level to a set of techniques which uh, follow the, the ideas I spoke about earlier where we expose software to information and it starts to learn interesting features about the data and they make uh, useful assessments of the data and predictions. And then deep learning is a particular uh, technique within machine learning to uh, build these so-called neur neural networks, which tend to have uh, very good properties are computationally uh, expensive at times, but have, have produced some really interesting results over the last few years. There are many other techniques in AI and machine learning. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I've got some uh, sites you can visit to learn more about. Obviously linear regression for people who've done statistics is a, is a commonly uh, known technique for, for analyzing data. Uh, decision trees are nice to know about. They, uh, there's, a, there's a really cool demo if you click through this slide where you kind of scroll through and I'm not actually going to do the whole thing. 
and maybe I can't. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So it takes some data and it shows you how it can be segmented and how you can analyze it in different ways, ultimately leading up to construction of a decision tree. Um, and so I highly recommend taking a look at that. Um, there are also other techniques like, sorry, uh, reinforcement learning, which has been quite an interest, produced a lot of interesting results in terms of teaching uh, software to solve certain tasks without having uh, data, supervised data to, to go by, just by having a reward function and a penalty uh, notion. And this is an example of, of uh, You can, you can see how it initially really didn't know what it was doing at all. After 200 training runs, it started getting a little bit better, but it's very jittery. Um, after 400 episodes, it's now actually getting probably comparable to a, a decent human player. Uh, but then after, I think it's 600 training episodes, something really interesting happens. It starts to discover uh, that there's a, a way to play the game that you might not even have ever known about if you, unless you've played this game a lot. But by directing the, the ball to the corners, you can actually break through. And that's probably where the game comes, game's name comes from. But I can rack up a lot of points there. So interesting that it didn't have to be told explicitly that this was a possibility. It found it and capitalized on it. And so. Um, sort of following that that theme of not having to enumerate, but letting the, the software discover interesting things about the world. Generative networks have been uh, a topic of great interest. They're um, somewhat notorious for a mechanism people use to build these deep fake uh, images and videos. This is an image from a, a site called, I think it's called thispersondoesntexist.com or something like that, where artificial human faces are rendered using a generative network. And in a nutshell, generative networks are essentially competitive neural networks where one network is building its best, is, is working as hard as it can to make the most uh, accurate rendering of, a, of, of, a, of some target. In this case, it's a human face. And another network is working hard to be the best possible judge of the same output. And so they're kind of working together as the, the discriminator network, the judge gets better and better. It's better at finding and instructing the uh, creator network as to which ones are, are good and which ones are not so good and vice versa. They're, they're sort of keeping each other honest throughout the process. Anyway, the, all of that is just to summarize that there are lots of different techniques in this domain. The one we're going to focus on tonight is uh, deep learning and neural networks in particular. Um, the last thing, I'm not going to play this for you, but if you come through back through the slides, I invite you to listen to this clip. This is a piece of music generated by uh, software, a deep learning network, and it's quite extraordinary. It's the first uh, thing that I've seen in this creative artistic domain. I won't say the first, but it's one of the most meaningful I've, I've felt. Uh, it's really something, so I invite you to listen to that. Um, that's sort of the basics. Next up, I'll talk about uh, neural networks and we'll jump into the lab together. But before I do that, let me take a few minutes to see if anyone has any questions. So we've not got any questions um, on this Slido yet. Um, okay. Enthusiasm uh, via YouTube. Um, James is a big fan of uh, generative adversarial networks, which is always good. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's. Was that a question, or he was saying he's a big, just sharing that he's a big fan about it? Yeah, cool. take um, take one minute um, to, to a glass of water or whatever. Um, if you've got a question, now's the time to to ask it.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, let me present slides. We'll now move into talking about neural networks and uh, start by just sharing the kind of the basic idea here. We've already covered this to a certain extent, but with classical programming, the way software has been written for, for many decades, we would uh, compose our programs based on rules. We would feed data into it and our rules would understand how to generate the answers. And the change is now we, we feed data and the answers, sample answers into the software and it spits out the rules. So that's the fundamental difference. And I wanna to try to illustrate that with an example. Um, if you visit the slides, again, you can click on that image and you should be able to read this. Um, this visual calculator. If you can't, let me know. Um, but what I've actually done here is simply written a, a very simple polynomial function. So it's a first order polynomial, f of actual of x equals a actual times x plus b actual. So a actual and b actual are just two parameters. And I've chosen them and I've hidden them in this um, folder. Uh, so I've defined this function and you can think of this as a guessing game. I chose A and B, A actual and B actual. You have to figure out what those values are. So you might, um, and, and you know that it's this first order, the structure of my function is AX plus B, but you don't know what my values are. So uh, you have these sliders and you can move them around. And depending on how you set them, you can get closer or further from my function. Um, and you can sort of tell just by looking at it that you want to do something like this, right? You want to have the same slope as mine. Then you want to move it until it gets closer and closer to my curve. And then you'll know that you've, you've hit it. So it's, this suggests that my actual parameters are minus 1.5 and 4, which it turns out that is exactly what they are. But this trick we do with our brains where we kind of just figure out how to find the right thing by looking at it, we're actually doing a lot of processing in our heads. And what we wanna do is come up with an algorithm that we could use to, to do the same thing. And so what this bottom cell is showing you is what we call a loss function, which is where we take the uh, difference between the guessed function and the actual function, we square it and divide by the number of, uh, and, and take the average, divide by two, and we sum it over a number of samples. So you can think of the n or the x from minus n to n as the values we're feeding in uh, as our, our input, our samples that we want to do our, our guessing on. And that produces this number, which is effectively the loss function. And so if you move the, if you don't even look at the screen, if you move these sliders and take a look at that, what's happening with the loss function, you can see it gets to a minimum when the A value is tweaked to the point where it has the same slope as the actual function. And then you can get even lower if you move the B value so that the, the line gets closer to the actual. And then if you, of course, cross over it, the loss goes up and starts to get bigger. So this gives you the idea of how we actually find these um, these uh, uh, functions, or rather these uh, weights. I haven't even explained what the weights are about, but we're, we're looking for these parameters that will make this model give us the correct outputs for some set of inputs. And this gives you an idea of how we can do that algorithmically. Now, I have one more sort of um, teaching tool like this, and you can take a look at this notebook as well yourself. It said mco.fyi slash VML for visualize machine learning. And the way this works is it does, I mean, the example I just showed you was very trivial, right? It was a first order polynomial with two parameters. And this takes it to uh, an nth order polynomial. So let's go to a fourth order polynomial. And given that you have five parameters to choose, okay? And so with these sliders, you can tweak those parameters to your heart's content and you can watch the um, curve change 
as you move these values. You make something a little more, a little more curvy. Now, what we can do is say guess, click the guess button. And what that will do is now take a wild guess about the, the curve. And all it's doing is generating five random values for those five coefficients. And then once we have a guess we want to start with, we can click learn. And what it's doing is very quickly uh, iterating by adjusting the coefficients until it gets the loss function between the guess and the target curve as low as possible. So this is now doing an nth order um, version of what I showed you in that in that two dimensional calculator. It's still two dimensional in the x uh, in the function's x value uh, sense in the polynomial, but it's n n dimensional in the sense of these parameters, and that's actually what we're trying to optimize here. So when we have a machine learning model, I like to think of it as a black box, where it takes some input and it gives us some output and it has a bunch of dials on it. And the dials are the ones that we want to turn in order to get the best possible results. And the, the dials for this example are these coefficients. And uh, one thing we can do, you, now you might wonder, okay, well, how did we know, how did TensorFlow, this is running with TensorFlow.js, by the way, which is an, uh, a version of TensorFlow that can run right in the browser. How did TensorFlow know uh, how to move those coefficients to get closer and closer. And it uses something called we call gradient descent. I suspect many of you know all about this. But um, if you reduce the polynomial all the way down to first order, and let's reset, uh, do a guess. You move the guess a little further away. OK. so. If you go with a two, uh, rather first order polynomial, what this notebook does is it uh, graphs the, this is labeled A, X, Y, and Z, but it's actually wrong. It should be A, B, and, and the loss function. So I have to fix that. But uh, the idea here is that you have these parameters and uh, the, the ones that you've chosen have resulted in, um, 0.5 and, and minus 0.4 have resulted in this loss value that you're seeing here. Sorry, I want to set this up so it looks good. Um, now let's actually go to uh, this number of iterations is telling us how many numbers to try, how many times to go through the algorithm before adjusting the parameters. So let's pull that all the way down to one. And don't know why that reset the view, but now let's do uh, learn and keep your eye on the orange ball. So it jumped all the way down to the bottom. What's happening is this surface is a 3D surface of the loss function associated with the parameter space with the C0 and C1 or A and B, as I called it in the other example. And so the uh, so TensorFlow is figuring out how to turn those dials by finding which um, turning the which direction and how much to turn the dial in order to get the the ball to kind of go down the hill as fast as possible. And you see it kind of made a yep. Uh, can you just zoom in a little bit just to uh, make the window a little bit bigger? Oh, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. That, yeah. I think that's that's better. Thank you very much. Cool. Yeah. So um, as you can see, it made a huge jump. And we see this a lot, this sort of 80-20 rule where we get a, make, get a lot of mileage out of the first, first few um, sets of iterations. But I'll keep going. You see both that the green predicted line or learned line, as it's called here, is getting closer with each step to the target. But you see the ball is also kind of settling down into the valley. And now it's, it's pretty much already all, all the way there. It's... Uh, you know, about as close as you can get. So um, hopefully this gives a little bit of a sense for what's going on when we're trying to find these, how to turn these dials on the on this black box. And uh, we'll see more examples of these boxes, but um, I want to invite you to come back whenever you like to this notebook. It should be available for you and you can play around with it. 
Okay, so the challenge that we're gonna work on is something probably many of you know about. It's a kind of a common uh, exercise for learning about machine learning called the MNIST data set, M-N-I-S-T. It's a famous um, classic data set of handwritten digits. And the challenge was, I think, I believe this was actually uh, originally a challenge formulated by the US Postal Service because they wanted to automate the scanning of uh, what we call zip codes, postal codes in the US. And so um, it's, uh, I think it's 60,000 handwritten digits, all labeled. So this is where we get to the supervised learning kind of kind of model where in order to teach by example, you have to know what the right answers are for all your training data. So this data set fortunately has uh, 60,000 uh, pixel, uh, pixelated digits and the appropriate labels, the correct known labels for each one. What we see as humans is some little blob, but what this is, uh, how this is stored inside the computer is essentially a grid uh, for the x, y values of the pixels and the or the x, y locations of the pixels. And then the values are encoded um, on a zero to one basis uh, for how uh, dark the pixel should be colored in a, on a grayscale level. And so you have coming into the, into your, you're, you're going to build something. It's, we'll call it a neural network because that's what it's going to be. But we're going to build a tool that's going to take these images in and imagine it takes these 28 by 28 pixels and stretches them out, 784 linear pixels. And we want to somehow generate a number for each of the possible outcomes, each of the categories. So we can wire up each of the pixels to each of those output stages, we'll call them neurons. And uh, each neuron is responsible for one job. So the zeros neuron's job is, is, is to estimate the probability that the input string of pixels is a zero, one is responsible for detecting ones and so on. And by judiciously choosing the, uh, the weights we apply to each of those lines you see there, we can essentially fine tune the, these detectors, the quality of these detectors. By the way, the detectors don't just say, yes, it's a seven. They say, I believe with probability 0. 0.63, it's a seven. So they're gonna express probabilities and the sum of all the expressed probabilities like any uh, good probability distribution will, will sum to one. Now, how many um, weights are there here? Well, there's 784 times 10, that's 700, seven, 1,840 weights. That's, those are the dials, right? So if you think of this as a black box, you've got seven, almost 8,000 dials to turn. And if you're a human, uh, you're not gonna have a good day. That's not gonna be fun at all. Uh, but because of the tricks, the techniques, the optimization techniques uh, we kind of looked at in the earlier examples, um, we're gonna have software that's gonna automatically find its way to turn those dials in just the right way to optimize the, the quality of these predictions. So how do we do that? We're gonna take batches of, of images, batches of these handwritten digits, and we're gonna feed them through this network. Now, what does it mean to feed them through the network? Well, essentially it's to multiply them by those weights. And so if you look at this uh, kind of matrix in the lower left, Think of each row as a digit, right? So the first row is the eight, the second row is the four, third row is the six and so on. So this is a matrix that's 784 pixels wide and assume it's a hundred images. We refer to this thing called a batch, which is just a collection of images we're gonna put through this model as just kind of one step of our algorithm. So this is 784 pixels wide and 100 images tall. Now the weights are these things that are gonna be dynamically changing. They're gonna start at some random values and we can capture the weights with a matrix that's 784 rows by 10 columns. Now, why is it that, the, why are those dimensions the significant ones? Well, we need one column for every uh, detector neuron, every one of those output stage neurons. And we need one row for every pixel of the input. 
So this is that, this matrix is sort of the numerical representation of this uh, riot of, of weights uh, that I showed you graphically there. So let's look at this, um, the, the, the matrix multiplication, and, and you don't actually need to know how matrix multiplication works in order to use this stuff. So I'm sharing some of this stuff just to explain kind of what's happening under the hood, but um, I've not done, you know, you do, you do not need to really use this because things like TensorFlow and PyTorch will do all this stuff for you. Uh, but I think it's fun to just understand what's happening. So when we multiply matrices, we kind of multiply a row by a column and then the next row by the next column. And when we do just the first step, the row by the first row by the first column, we multiply the pairwise elements and we get, and we sum those multiplications and we get a result. So that's a prediction essentially. And if you think about it, the, the multiplication of a matrix is uh, the inner dimensions cancel out. So this is 780 or rather uh, 100 by 784 times 784 by 10. So we're gonna end up with a matrix that's 100 by 10. And that makes sense because there's 100 images and we want 10 estimates for the probability of all digits. So anyway, uh, probably going through this in, in a little more, more depth than I should, but um, the idea I wanna get across to you is we're doing math here. We're taking a bunch of images, doing a bunch of mathematical operations and getting all these predictions. And then what we wanna do is take the predictions and put them through uh, what we call an activation function. And an activation function simply massages the results of that function in some desired way. Now the output stage where we're gonna apply these, uh, this activation function, uh, it turns out to be a function called softmax is particularly helpful for, for these sort of classification algorithms. And uh, the way this works, the reasons for that are that uh, softmax has this um, characteristic that it produces a, a a, dis, a probability distribution and it ensures all of the values are normalized and meaning they're between zero and one and they sum to one. But the other nice property is that it tends to, softmax tends to stretch out the winner, so to speak, and lower the rest of the rest of the, the runners up, as you can see by this graphic. So softmax is useful for sort of emphasizing which is the which is the leading candidate from this network. So to kind of back up a, a step here, um, you, I, I think all of the parts of a neural network we've now talked about, or almost all of them, uh, but this is sort of a general schematic for how these work. You have input data and you send them through layers. Now we had a very trivial network so far, which was a two layer network, or, or really it was a one layer network, but um, we send the data more generally through a sequence of layers and each layer is doing a data transformation just like the one we looked at. And it's producing a set of predictions uh, for that input. And then we also know the true values for the same input and we can compare the two. We use this loss function just like we did in the polynomial example and we get a score. And then we uh, turn, it, turn that information over to an optimizer. And the optimizer's job is essentially to find how to move that ball down the hill from that 3D graph. So the optimizer takes this loss score and everything it knows about the function, and it turns the dials by adjusting those weights that are going to affect the next round through the network. And then we just repeat that until we've done enough passes through the data or until we're satisfied for some other criteria. That's the neural network 101 content. Um, the next step is a few slides and then a lab exercise. So we'll see how that goes. Um, any questions up to this point before I jump into the lab? Yeah, so we've, got, we've got a couple. So um, there's a couple of questions about, um, asking about if you can just go back over the 10 neurons and what they're used for. Um, that's all the data I've got. I assume um, around kind of the ten output, uh, like for the I assume the output layer. Yes. And in first, and in first, I guess underlying that, there's a new question about what layers even mean. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so um, in these neural networks, we basically are creating little nodes that we call neurons. And their job is to take input uh, from a bunch of sources to run a function on them that we call the activation function and to produce an output. And a lot of people talk about how uh, these neurons are a rough analog, analog to the neurons in our brain, and that's why they're called neurons. They're not exactly the same as biological neurons, but they do uh, have that similar model of taking input, and the input is weighted based on the, the, the feed from upstream, and they perform some kind of calculation that tells the, the node or the neuron how strongly to signal its output. So um, think of the right-hand section as a layer of 10 neurons, and each one is getting input from all 784 of these input pixels. I'm hesitating to call these a, a layer because um, I guess you could think of it that way, depending on how you, how you code it up. But really what's happening is we're just taking these values, multiplying them by some weight. So every one of these colored lines has a weight summing it all and then running it through the activation function. And as far as what are these actually producing, um, let's say this image, this eight that you see here is sent through the network. All 10 of these nodes, these neurons will, will uh, essentially be fed 784 weighted sums. It'll add them all together or weighted values. It'll, it'll add them all together, apply the activation function and then spit out a probability. So you can think of the zero might spit out, you know, 0.01, one might say 0.02, three, because an eight kind of looks closer to a three than some other digits. It might say, well, I think there's a 0.2 chance or 0.26 chance this is an eight and so on. And the eight you would hope would very strongly signal, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that, that it thinks it's an eight. I hope that helps. Um, yeah, certainly. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so we had one question just before um, that came in just after you moved on um, about the musical composition um, that you mentioned just mm -hmm. before. Um, now, I'm afraid I don't think I understand the question. Um, but the musical composition mentioned in the introduction, can you comment on the process and how machine learning can replicate aesthetic value judgment or taste? Uh, I think I would have to research it. I, I don't know uh, actually myself. This was, if you look at this video, it's a um, sort of a contest where they had a bunch of um, machine learning people, sort of like Kaggle, although it wasn't Kaggle that was running this one. They had a bunch of machine learning people try to generate music and um, the evening was they got uh, a string quartet, like you see here, to play all of the pieces that were the winners or the most popular or whatever. And um, the one that I've got this video cued to, if you click through, is the one that I found most uh, impressive. I don't actually know the, the technology they used, but if you look at the video, you should be able to track down the details with the, of the contest and find out more. Cool, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of a couple more questions about, um, yeah, I, I guess about neural networks. So the first is, um, how do you decide how many neurons to put in your hidden layers? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, it's really uh, more of an engineering function than a than a scientific function, meaning there's no real good answer to that. Where like I can say, oh, for this network, I'm going to run this. Um, calculation and tell you you should use seven uh, neurons in your layer in your third layer. Uh, it's more of a uh, engineering discipline where we copy what has worked and we uh, experiment trial and error to get the best results. Now, having said that, humans are not very good at that. Machines are very good at that. And what we're starting to see now is something called AutoML, which is where we use neural networks to build neural networks. And I'll have some more slides on that later on in this talk, but it's actually proven to be quite, quite a successful approach. Thanks. Um, 
And yeah, the second neural network question. Um, will you always have as many neurons in your final layer as your number of classes? For a classification problem, yes, typically you will. Yeah. And um, you know, there are all sorts of different problems you're going to face, and they have different arrangements of output stages. They have different uh, final activation functions that they will typically use. I'll share a book at the end of the talk, which I think is the best resource I've seen for kind of a really nice rules of the road for how to build these, these networks. But for a classification problem, yes, you'll typically have one output node for every category, and you'll probably be using softmax as the activation function. Cool. Um, what would be the usual way to get the weights that multiply the value of each pixel as it changes the probability of the outputs? Yeah, so there, um, the, the weights are absolutely affecting the output probabilities, and that's the whole point. You want to tune those weights so that you get probabilities that are as close as possible to the desired outputs. I mean, ideally, you know, that those in our example, the you give it an eight and the, the eight digit would be a probability one and all the others would be zero. It never gets that good. But um, yeah, the weights are these smallish numbers that um, uh, affect in a cascading way what the final answers are. And one of the tricks people sometimes use is to scale those, those weights, to normalize or, or modify the weights in interesting ways. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think, um, got, yeah, I think this is probably a good time to carry on now. Um, if you got any more questions, then, you know, ask them in YouTube, um, pop them in Slido, and we'll get to them later on. Okay, thank you for those. Um, yeah, we'll jump into the lab section. There's a, just a few slides to give a little bit of background on the tools we're going to be using in the lab. Um, the first one is TensorFlow. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. It's, uh, it's an open source computational graph tool. <laughs> I'm not sure. Most people say it's an, a machine learning uh, tool, but it's actually got some interesting other applications like uh, probability distributions and statistical analysis and stuff like that. Um, but it turns out to be extremely handy for uh, deep learning networks and doing the sort of things that we need to do with symbolic differentiation and backpropagation and all those things that you don't want to have to actually think about. You just want it to work. Um, it was launched uh, about four years ago and uh, was created internally. Uh, it's the standard tool we use in Google for our machine learning and AI capabilities. Um, it's certainly not the only uh, good library out there. PyTorch is very po popular. Um, Scikit-learn is popular. There's, there's a bunch of great, great libraries out there. So uh, I, I like TensorFlow just because it's very well proven at Google and it's gotten uh, a lot of attention and uptake uh, throughout the industry. So it's very popular. And the more people use it, the more, you know, um, refined, I think, and, and, and industrial strength the tool gets. Um, but it's certainly not the only one. And I invite you to learn about all the different ones that are out there for your own individual challenges. Um, there's a site, tensorflow.org, where you can learn all about TensorFlow. It's got a lot of good examples and documentation and so on. And in the exercise we do together, we're going to use a tool called Keras, or a library called Keras. Keras is a higher level of abstraction on top of TensorFlow. Um, I'm sure many of you know and have used it. It's uh, actually started out life as a more general layer that had um, the ability to work with different uh, computational engines of which TensorFlow was only one. Uh, but since uh, its origin, it's now been integrated into the TensorFlow distribution and it's sort of become the official high-level uh, interface for programming with TensorFlow. I've done a little bit of work with TensorFlow natively and I've used Keras and um, there's no doubt in my mind that Keras is a much friendlier and uh, easier to work with and more approachable interface. So if you're interested in getting into this area, 
I highly recommend starting with Keras, and that's what we'll use in the in the lab. Um, this is what we're going to do in the lab. We're going to build a neural network to recognize those MNIST digits together, culminating, if everything goes well, in a little uh, integrated widget where we can draw digits and get the probability estimate. So I would like for all of you to navigate to this URL, mco.fyi slash mllab, all one word, M-L-L-A-B. And I will go there as well. We'll give folks a minute to, to get there. Now, um, Make sure this is shared with everyone. I just realized, I think I created a new copy of this and I didn't share it. So, um, da, da, da. need to find the, share this with anyone. Okay, so if you struggle to get into that um, notebook, I hope you can now do it. I'm going to wait until I hear of at least a few people getting in. I'm sorry about that last minute glitch. Double check this. Anyone on the internet with this link can comment. And maybe. Uh, Joe or John can let me know if people are getting in. Yeah, just waiting for some feedback. Um, I'm waiting for it to load up my PC. Um, I am running read only notebooks is not supported. Um, I need to make a copy of the notebook or switch to playground mode. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people are seeing it. They're getting a warning that it's read only, which is fine. And actually, that was the first thing I was going to tell you to do is once you come into this notebook, click file, save a copy, and drive. Let me blow this up a little bit. So you'll click file, save a copy, and drive. And it will create a copy of this notebook. And in the upper left, you'll see the title copy of what my notebook was called, mllab.ip. Y and B. Okay, so hopefully everyone has their own copy. Double check your runtime by saying runtime, change runtime type, and make sure you've got a GPU accelerator set. Um, and with that, you should have everything you need. And what we'll do is run through this notebook. But before we do that, let me just summarize what you're looking at for anybody who's new to this. So I'm going to get out of my copy, you stay in yours. Uh, go back to my original. Uh, this is a Jupyter Notebook. It's uh, Many of you I know are familiar with this, but it's a, um, an interactive document that includes code and documentation. So it's a really nice way to teach and learn because you kind of walk through this document and then you'll find uh, snippets of code you can run. And that code will be sent off to a server. It will run the code for you. And you get to see the results right here in the notebook. Uh, normally, the biggest problem with Jupyter is you have to set up and administer your own server. Excuse me. <coughs> you have to set up a Jupyter server. This is using something called Google Colab, which is uh, Jupyter notebooks hosted in the cloud. <clears throat> and it's very close to the model you see with uh, Google Drive, where um, you know, you have your copies of your notebooks and you can share them as you saw I did earlier with, with co collaborators. And um, you can actually save them in Drive or, or in GitHub or other places. And um, it just takes away the hassle of having to stand up a server. So that's one of the reasons I like to use this. Um, so we'll walk through this, this notebook. And uh, one note is that this is derived from uh, a very nice uh, series of lectures called Learn TensorFlow Without a PhD. It's much longer than we're going to have time for today, but I recommend if you really like this area, diving in deeper at that site. 
Uh, we're going to train on GPU and we're going to test our model interactively. So we've all set GPU to be the hardware accelerator. Now we're going to install and import some things. So what are we installing? We're installing TensorFlow and TFTS, which is a, a data manipulation system for TensorFlow, as well as Matplotlib. Although I think Matplotlib might come automatically pre-installed. I'm not sure about that. So pip install is Python's way of saying install these packages. But in order to use them, you still need to say import in Python. So we're importing NumPy, TensorFlow, TensorFlow datasets, and so on. Um, and we're printing out at the end which version of TensorFlow we're using. So that was just getting things set up in our environment. Now we're going to set some parameters, which is the, the batch size. That's the, if you remember those, that stack of 100 images we, we fed into our network, we're going to do 64 here. Uh, the number of epochs is how many times we want our entire set of data to travel through our network. Because each time we pass, make one pass, uh, we're kind of converging on better and better quality. And we're going to try to do it 10 times. So we'll set epoch to 10. The learning rate has to do with how fast and how far we move the dials when we want to make an optimization. We don't want to go too fast because there are pitfalls to uh, moving the optimization point so far that we're kind of thrashing around the actual minimum. But we also don't want it, that to be too small because that means we're, we're letting that ball just roll a little bit down the hill each, each time through the network. So we're going to set this learning rate of 0.01, which tends to, to be fairly useful. But we're actually going to see later that we're going to tune that dynamically. Now that we've run those, set those parameters, <clears throat> run the cell that says, let's have a look at the data. TensorFlow has uh, a bunch of data sets uh, built right in. And so I don't have to go find this MNIST data set I can, uh, or, and download it. I can just tell TensorFlow that's what I want to work with. If you do tfds.list, I think, it will give you all of the data sets in TensorFlow's catalog, and there's a lot of them. Um, so this is just loading the, the data from TensorFlow into memory. And then I'm showing some examples. So you can see what we're looking at. We're actually, what these digits, what nine of these digits actually look like. Pretty much what I showed you before with the labels. And then we print DS info, which is some info that TensorFlow returned about the data set. So this is just a collection of metadata. The name is MNIST. This is the version. If you want to visit the home page, you can find out all about this data set by going there. Um, the, the size and shape of the data, the total number of examples, and I think I said 60,000, there's actually 70,000 divided into 60,000 for training and 10,000 for testing. Um, so that's all good. Hopefully everybody's seeing the, the data. Make noise if you're not, and Joe will interrupt me. Um, now we're going to set some, run some utility functions. And all this is doing is defining some functions that we're going to use later. So this is loading MNIST, dividing it into the training set and the test set, uh, scaling the images, and uh, refreshing the data for each time we want to try to do a training loop. So this is just defining some functions we're going to use later. I, I have this closed by default because it's not really germane to the whole machine learning challenge, but feel free to expand these cells by double clicking on them to see what they're doing. Then I have a training utilities uh, function. This is really just about what kind of environment you want to do the training in. You can use a CPU, a GPU, or a TPU. I'll say more about what a TPU is in the, the cloud section coming up ahead. Uh, and this, based on how you're going to train, it calculates the uh, appropriate batch size a dynamic learning rate and returns uh, some values so that you can then use to do the training. Compile is just a shorthand function to bundle in some uh, statistic or some algorithmic elements we want to use when we compile the model. I didn't explain what compiling a model means. I will when we get a little bit further down. Just know that this is a function you can use to kind of inform Keras how to create your model, what the basic parameters are about your model. 
Um, and then train is a function that I'm using to actually kick off the training. It calculates what's called the steps per epoch, how many steps to go through all the data each epoch. I'm setting up something called a TensorBoard callback, which is something we'll use to monitor the progress of the training using a tool called TensorBoard. And then this is really where the, the work is being done. Model.fit. This is calling a function which says to Keras, I've defined this model. We've compiled it so you know the high-level specifications of my loss function, the optimizer, and what metrics I want you to track. Now go ahead and train it by calling fit. And I pass to fit the training data, the validation or test data, the number of steps for each epoch, the number of validations to do with each, with each step number of epochs, and then some callbacks. I want it, uh, I'm asking Keras to call those functions each time at the end of each epoch, each time through the training data. So again, convenience functions. Uh, so I've kind of hidden them a little bit just to not go into too much depth on them. Uh, now let's actually create a network together. So I'm going to skip over start tensor board. Well, I'll actually run it. Start tensor board will start the TensorBoard utility, which will display training information or tell us how the training went after we're done. I'm just going to keep this cell around. Um, it says no data because we haven't done any training yet. But when we actually start training a model, this will help us see how it how it went. Um, one nice thing about this Colab notebook is it's um, able to do the TensorBoard right in line with the, the rest of the code. OK, let's make a network. So the first network I'm calling good. Um, I'm removing some logs in case there are any left over from the last run. At this point, it's my first time through, so there won't be any, any data to worry about. But that's just cleaning up. I call that set strategy function to get the strategy for CPU, GPU, or TPU. And we're going to use GPU by default. I, I get the batch size and the K function. And then I say, with the strategy that I just arranged, create a model. And here's where we use uh, Keras syntax to build a model. We say we want a sequential model. Uh, don't get too hung up on that. There's another kind of model called a functional model. But for most uses, especially beginner use cases, sequential is fine. It just means it's one stage after another. It's a typical layer after layer model. So we create a sequential model. And then we use list syntax. This is Python list syntax to, to specify the layers. And the layers are defined with tf.keras.layers.something, which corresponds to the type of layer you want. The first layer in this very simple model is going to take the input data, which is 28 bits by 28 bits by, by one byte. Sorry, 28 by 28 by one byte. It's not bits. It's each value in that 28 by 28 grid is a is a byte giving us the uh, so we're taking about, this kind of two-dimensional array of bytes. Yep. I'm sorry, yeah, there's a little sorry? issue at that. Can you repeat what you said? Oh yes. Um, we're taking the uh, we're defining a, a, a model here by specifying a sequential uh, model. This is the simplest kind of model, and it corresponds to the one you'll most normally use. And we're defining a sequence in a list. This is Python list function. And the list has two elements. And each element corresponds to one of the layers in our neural network. And so you see this, um, this Keras interface is essentially like a Lego brick model, where you say, here's layer one, here's layer two, here's layer three, and it just kind of assembles them into the actual software for you. So you don't have to think in terms of weights and biases and matrices and multiplication. You just specify the, the characteristics of the neural network at a nice abstract layer or way, overusing layers a little too much. Um, so the two layers I've defined here, one is called flatten. It's taking the 28 by 28 grid of pixel values, grayscale values, and it's flattening them so that it's one long array of 784 values. It's just taking away the complexity of the fact that they're arranged in squares, square grids. And then I define a dense layer. And dense to Keras means this layer should have every node 
strongly connected to the previous layer. So this is telling it, I want 10 neurons and I want all 10 of them to be directly connected to every input in the flattened layer. And I'm also telling it, I want you to use softmax as the activation function. So if you remember, that's useful because it gives us a probability distribution. So that corresponds to the, the diagram you saw earlier in my slides. This is that strongly connected uh, network. And it's just about the simplest possible neural network you could imagine creating. I then use my utility function compile to tell it, okay, I want to use a certain optimizer and a certain loss function and uh, keep track of certain uh, metric accuracy. I print model.summary, which gives me a visual text summary of the model. And then I call my train function and I'm going to call this model good because it's kind of good, but not great. Um, and I pass it the model and the strategy and the batch size. So let's run that. You go ahead as well, click on that. And hopefully you'll see something like what I'm seeing here. Uh, maybe you won't because I forgot to execute my training utility, I bet. I'm hoping that's what it was. Let me try again. Good. So one of the things about Jupyter networks is they're stateful. And if you forget to invoke a certain cell that's halfway through and it's needed by something that is down, down lower in the notebook, you're gonna have a, a problem as I just did. Um, this is now spitting out some statistics for um, every epoch. You see it's going through them pretty quickly about eight seconds for the first one and four seconds for the subsequent ones. And at the end of every epoch, it's printing out the accuracy on the training data and the accuracy on the validation data. So this one is just about done. And it's showing us that on the training data, it's receiving about 93, it's getting about 93, almost 94%. And a about similarly high 93 percentile on the validation data, on the test data. And if I now go back up to TensorBoard, should be able to, I think this is in a little bit of a weird state. So I'm gonna restart TensorBoard and you can feel free to do that as well. Okay, so if you, um, you should have something like this, select scalars if you don't see it. And this is showing you the training curve for each epoch. Um, if you set smoothing to zero, it will take away the smoothing uh, algorithm that it's trying to do. And this is showing you that the, uh, the training data ended up around 93.65 and the uh, validation ended up about very close, 93.75. So that's giving us a little bit of a history. And Tensor, TensorBoard, by the way, is useful for all sorts of other things, which I'm not going to go through. But you can see things like graphs of the network that you've created, um, distribute, data distributions, and so on. Um, so it's a great tool to know about. And you can, you can dive pretty deeply into TensorBoard. Um, let's just look at the network here. It's model sequential, and then it shows a table of layers. Um, the flattened layer has no parameters because it's just doing something very mechanical, one in, one out. Uh, but the dense layer has 7,850 parameters. And where does that come from? Well, it's got the weights associated with each of those lines from the 784 inputs to the uh, 10 outputs, that's 7840. Where are the other 10 coming from? These are bias values, which I didn't talk about so much, but you can think of the biases as giving you one extra uh, degree of freedom to tweak this model. So it's 10 extra dials, but unlike the weights, which are one per arc, the dials are one per neuron. So there are, more, uh, there, there are fewer of them to optimize, but it gives you the ability to adjust things, fine tune things. Uh, in, in addition to the weights. So we've gotten through this network. Hopefully you've seen, gotten something like 93%. Is 93% good? Well, it seems like a decent number for 
such a simple network. Like I said, this is about the simplest network you can imagine building. But if you were the US Postal Service and you were wanting to uh, base your mail delivery on this network, 93 wouldn't really be that good. That would mean seven out of every 100 packages was getting delivered to the wrong address. So uh, typically, we actually want to do much better than 93%. So how do we get better? Uh, one thing we can do is add more layers. Somebody asked how many layers? Well, more is often better, not always, but often better. So what we're going to do is from the, uh, the previous model, we're going to add two intermediate layers. We also call these hidden layers. Somebody referred to that term in one of their questions. And um, the way this works is we define these dense layers between the flatten and the final output layer. Now you'll notice we only define the input shape in the flattened layer. We don't define the input shape in the subsequent layers. And that's because Keras knows what's coming out of the layer before it. So you don't need to tell it what it looks like, which is nice. It's less, less bookkeeping for you to keep track of. Um, we can set this to 200, 100. There's another layer with 60. The key is that we typically cascade from a larger number of nodes to a smaller number. And the number of layers and the number of neurons per layer will dictate oftentimes the quality of our results. And this is kind of going back to the question about how do I know? We tend to, you know, it, it's it, maybe it's a little uh, almost embarrassing, but we tend to base a lot of the practices here on copy and paste. Basically, we know what works. We've found through experimentation what works. And this tends to be a decent uh, performing still relatively small network for the MNIST problem. So let's try this out. Go ahead and run that. And now the summary is showing us, whereas the previous one had, I think, 50, what was it, 50, uh, sorry, 78, 50 parameters. This one now has uh, 169,000 parameters. So because of what we're doing when we add these layers and we add these neurons is we're giving it more parameters to tune, which in a way is bad because the job just got a little, a lot bigger. There's now 170,000 dials to turn. But that represents information. You can store more information about the data when you have more weights. And so there's a fine sort of trade-off between going big with the weights and the size of your network making it harder to compute, but also giving you a lot more value in the, in the quality of the output. Um, I should add that if you go too big, the problem won't be that your, uh, your network is computationally infeasible. I mean, it may be, but that's not the bigger problem. The bigger problem is that your network will tend to be overfitting the data. If you think of an extreme example where you have one neuron for every possible input and they just know, memorize those inputs, you've got a network that is perfectly 100% accurate with your entire training corpus, uh, but it's terrible at generalizing. And that's what happens uh, when we talk about overfitting where we have too many degrees of freedom. So this one hopefully gave you some pretty good results. Uh, the accuracy on the training data is uh, good to know, but the real test is the accuracy on the validation data. I didn't really make this clear, but typically what you do when you're working on these sort of problems is you, you divide your data up into uh, training data and test data. When you train on the training data, you don't ever train on the test data because you want to hold the test data aside or the validation data aside in order to um, make sure the network has never seen that data. And so you're really getting a good read on how good that network generalizes to data it's not seen before. People also talk about training data, validation data, and test data where the test is sort of one level further down the road. You've used the validation on each epoch. When you're happy with your network, you can turn it loose on some test data. I realize I'm talking to Pi data people, so I'm sure you all know all about this stuff. So I just want to make sure people who may be new here um, are, are, are understanding some of the terminology I'm using. Um, OK, so we got much better results, 96.88%, which is nice. How do we get even further? Now, the thing you'll notice with these um, kind of problems is uh, every tenth of a percent gets harder and harder to, to achieve. 
it's sort of like, you know, the last mile is just, you know, practically feels impossible. And so you have to start getting really advanced. Um, and what we're going to do to get to the last level of accuracy is we're going to use something that's become pretty much the standard way of analyzing um, image data, which is to, to use something called a convolutional network. Now, convolutional networks, uh, the idea behind them is instead of looking at three-dimensional data as one big chunk, they actually scan the data because there's a lot of value in understanding the locality, especially when you're looking at an image. Um, a pixel that's dark in a certain zone relation to the, the pixels around it has meaning and has value in understanding what's going on. So when our first layer is this flattened layer, we're essentially throwing away useful information. All of the, the relationship location-wise between pixels is lost. We've just turned it into this big long string. And it's actually quite amazing that the network still does as good as it does, even when we've thrown away all that information. But for our last optimization, we're going to not throw that away. We're going to take the input as it is, 28 by 28 by 1, and we're going to do something called convolve, which means uh, that we're using this conv2d layer to create something called a convolution. Convolution means we're going to sort of scan the image, in this case, 3 by 3, in 3 by 3 grids. And we're going to do something called batch normalization, which I'm not actually going to even try to go into, but it's a way of pooling the results of a layer to, find, to sort of optimize the output within that layer. So this stuff starts to get really uh, involved. And it's also like I'm going to be waving my hands and not really adequately explaining things in this example, because to give it justice, I think I need a lot more time than I have. What I want you to do, if you're interested in digging deeper, is go to the P the machine learning without a PhD thing. And you can learn all about batch normalization and dropout. Um, but I actually, I said something about combining results and pooling them. That's actually called batch pooling. Batch normalization has to do with tweaking the range of the weights of the, out, of the outgoing values, rather. Um, the other thing that's interesting is this is using these convolutional layers typically use an activation function called ReLU, R-E-L-U which is different from softmax, and it works better for these types of internal um, convolutional layers. So I've got three convolutional layers. Each one is doing this batch normalization and then applying the ReLU activation function. Once I'm through those three, and you can think of each, each of those convolutional layers as scanning the two-dimensional uh, data grid, one kind of grid at a time. When I'm through those three layers, I flatten it. And I go back to a similar kind of model as I used before, a 200 uh, ne <clears throat> neuron dense layer using batch normalization there as well and ReLU again. Then I apply something called dropout, which is useful for this overfitting problem I alluded to. Dropout simply randomly deletes uh, whatever percent of the nodes outputs you want to get rid of. Now, why would you just blindly delete output values? Um, well, it's actually input values to this last layer. But why would you delete useful information? The reason is that it turns out that by randomly throwing away some of the data, you end up avoiding this overfitting scenario where you've conformed too closely to the training data. So again, you can read all about dropout in the uh, ML without a PhD thing. And I'll have a link to that um, stuff in my slides. But the final layer is the one we've been seeing all along. It's the dense layer with 10 nodes and softmax activation. We're using our compile and train functions for the last time. And this is really the best we can, we should be able to achieve. We're up to 354,000 parameters. So this is now going to be a little bit harder to do computationally. The reason it's going as fast as it is is because I had you um, configure a GPU at the beginning of this session. So a GPU is a, a special hardware device that speeds up the calculations that are typically needed for this kind of neural networking. Um, if I hadn't had you configure that and you ran this on the CPU and you can try that, of course, um, it will take 
this will take minutes. It's not terrible, but you know, each, each epoch will probably take on the order of a minute. So instead of this being a 10 minute wait, it's just going to be about a minute, six seconds per layer or per epoch. And as you can see, our accuracy is getting really much higher. 9996 on the training data. And 9844 on the evaluation data. I actually wanted to get to 98%. So I'm going to have to work on this a little bit more. But um, if we go back to our tensor board, let's go to the scalars tree. And somehow tensor board doesn't always refresh very well for me. So what I end up doing is rerunning the start tensor board cell. It reuses the back end, but it creates a new front end, which seems to sort of wake up and see the, the more, more recent data. So let's roll down the smoothing. And yeah, we can see that, um, let's highlight just good, or just good training, better training, best training. So as you can see, the better training was really like the huge jump um, and then getting a little bit more quality just tends to be, to be harder. I think I'm not doing something right in the convolutional uh, example because in the past I've gotten that well above 99 in 99.5% on the validation data. Let's take a look at the validation data. That's good, better, and best. And so this shows that the validation is significantly improving each time. I'm not sure why my validation data is as discrete as it is. I think there's something not right there. Um, but hopefully this gives you a sense of, of how this stuff works and some of the tools you can use to, to create neural networks. Um, question came up, does the dense 10 parameter mean it's a complete network, full connections, given there are 10 digits? Uh, the very first network, it, dense means connect all of the input pixels, all 784, to the 10 output pixels. Uh, but dense in general means connect every neuron in this layer to all of the outputs of the previous layer. So this flatten is giving us 784, and we're connecting all 784 of those outputs to the 200 layers and uh, 200 neurons in this layer. This dense layer is saying, I want 60 nodes, 60 neurons, and I want every one of them connected to the 200 neurons in the previous layer. And then this dense layer is saying, I want 10 neurons, and I want each of those 10 connected to the 60 neurons in the previous layer. So altogether, we should have 60 connections from this one to this layer to this layer, 60 times 200 connections for the previous layer, and 200 times 784. And this is actually showing you that. You're seeing a little bit modulo the bias numbers, but this is giving you that. Okay, so that's it. We've made a super, pretty good, pretty high, I won't call it super amazing, but it's a, it's a good quality neural network. Uh, we had to use a lot of tricks and, and advanced techniques. Now I want you to try and actually exercise your network. So click this cell that says model.save. This is right after the, the cell with the, the last model we, we built. Um, what is that doing? That is taking the model you just built and saving it to a file on disk. That's all. The next cell, click as well, is running a bunch of shell commands. Uh, it's installing TensorFlow.js because we're now going to run TensorFlow JavaScript inside the browser. And it's uh, cloning a GitHub repo that I created, which has some browser side software to let you exercise this model. So when that's done, you can click on this run some interactive tests. And what this is doing is kind of putting some JavaScript code right into the notebook so that it can run the, the, JavaScript, the TensorFlow JS code to actually carry out requests on the model you built. So let's run that. And you should see something like this, I hope. TensorFlow JS plus MNIST. That loading model should go away as it did. And now what you can do is take your mouse and draw a digit. And what you'll see on the right is a probability distribution that is dynamically changing 
what's happening is every time you move the mouse a certain distance, uh, JavaScript event is running a function which is saying um, feed this current version of this this canvas, this two-dimensional grid of pixels to the model. And the model is the last one you created, the one you exported with that, that cell a few, a few cells back. So if you go back through this notebook and you run a different model or run like the second one and stop there, when you hit model.save, the last one you built is the one you'll get in this interactive widget. Um, so uh, yeah, it takes, it gets an event every time you move the mouse a certain amount. It runs the grid of pixels into the model and gets a prediction. And you know, right now it's very definitive, but let's do something like that. It thinks it's a one, but the seven has a probability as well. I'm just drawing random stuff to see if I can like confuse it. Thinks it's a two. Yeah, it's like, so this shows you that, you know, it's not just a all or nothing, it's probabilities that you're getting. And it thinks it's a four, which I guess that's kind of okay. Um, here's a real four, here's a seven, does pretty well. Um, I'll leave it to you as an exercise to see if you can fool this, this model. It's actually not that hard because there's something I'm not doing that I should do. And feel free to guess uh, during question time. Um, that's really it for the for the the interactive lab. The rest of this shows how to take a trained model and deploy it, train it, and run it on the Google Cloud platform. I'm not going to go through that because there's more setup to it. You need to have an, a Google account. I mean, a cloud account, and it's just. I mean, I just want you to know that you can do that. So if you want to train, uh, because this environment we're in, CoLab, is not unlimited. Like it's free for everyone and, and nice, but if you actually try to do real production work on it, you will be throttled after a while because, I mean, your performance will be throttled after a while because um, you know it's not made to just be an endless compute device. So if you have a, a production use for notebooks and for models, of course, um, we have a whole platform of products that you can use to train and deploy your models. And that's what the rest of this notebook's all about. Um, I think that's it for the, here's the um, link to the TensorFlow and Deep Learning Without a PhD series. So that's for advanced folks that want to dive deeper. The rest of my talk, the third section is about machine learning in the cloud, some of the tools we provide at Google for doing things. Um, and uh, I think I'll, I'll stop now for questions and maybe give folks a short break. Yep, thanks, Mark. Uh, we'll take a yeah minute or two just for questions. Um, well, just questions and a break. Okay.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, thanks for hanging in here with this, with me as long as you have. I hope you had some fun with the lab we just did. I know it was a lot of material uh, to swallow, but um, you know, think of it as an as a, as a journey. You're just getting started on maybe, or you're uh, reinforcing some ideas you already knew about. Uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning, feel free to contact me if if you have questions and or I can help you in any way. The last section is based upon um, machine learning in the cloud, but I'm conscious of the fact that I've been going for quite a while and you've been listening to me drone on for a long time. So I'm gonna go quite quite rapidly through this section. I may skip a few of the demos and things that takes more of the time, um, but uh, I will be happy to come back to this group in the future if I can go more into detail, if you would like me to. So the uh, thing about the cloud, the thing I like about it is I, Think of it as a way to get things done using other people's computers, especially where the other person worries about us, the infrastructure. As a person who likes doing data science, I don't really uh, want to spend my time thinking about uh, infrastructure, operating system, security, uh, all the stuff that, that, that is really important, but that isn't central to my problem. Uh, the Google Cloud in particular has a ton of capabilities. When I started at Google in 2011, there were four cloud products. We now have, as you can see, uh, over 100. And uh, this, I sort of see this as a double-edged sword. It's, uh, it's a very nice to have all, the, all that power, but it can also be a little bit intimidating because there's a lot to learn there. Um, let's skip the, this is kind of reinforcing the, I don't really want to think about infrastructure. I just want to solve my problem. But if we focus specifically on AI and machine learning, there's a number of offers we have, which are very handy for, um, for doing that stuff, but also for um, lowering the bar. So, you know, being able to do things without knowing a lot about machine learning and so democratizing it. This is just one of my joke slides where I, we have a service called Vision API. You can send a uh, image to Google and there, it will tell you lots of things about the image. And uh, I, I think this is a funny example of how we're learning what things are cool to, to, to predict about an image. This one I uploaded, there's a website where you can just drag and drop an image. So I put this image of myself and it told me that I was a senior citizen, uh, which I didn't like all that much, but uh, I've since done that again and it doesn't make guesses about my gender or my age. So I think we're, we're improving gradually. Um, but more seriously, the, the thing I mentioned when we were talking about how you build and fine tune these networks, uh, I mentioned AutoML and we've seen over the years that AutoML is actually outperforming human engineered neural networks, um, by quite a bit. And it's also doing it at a lower computational cost. So it's both faster and higher quality. And so hard to beat that. And what you'll what we're finding is that um, we're finding ways to make that technology available to everyone in the cloud. And that's really exciting because it means that you can take advantage of um, these you know, neural networks that are able to build a network better than you could do by hand. And also it frees you from having to even know how to build a network. This is a, an array of all the services we have available. I'm not gonna go through them all. This is a demo of um, the Vision API. It's a big cloud of um, images and you can sort of navigate to, you can try this demo on your own by clicking through the, the slide, but you can navigate to any image in here and uh, you click on one of the images or one of these pre-selected images it'll show you what it knows about that image in terms of you know, landmarks and location and text and all sorts of things. Just kind of glossing over that for now for, for time, but feel free to play with that. Um, AutoML Vision is really interesting. It's basically doing something called transfer learning as well as neural network architecture search to find the best way to tie your images to Google's base image model. So Google, um, Vision API, the thing I just showed you very briefly, is a really rich data set or model rather of image data built up on billions of images. And imagine you have a problem that's image based. You would love to be able to take advantage of that richness without starting from scratch. And that's what transfer learning is all about. It's a way to kind of graft your data 
onto the uh, output of Google's existing data or model. And, uh, you know, you, you tend to get the best of both worlds. You get the value of the underlying model and then you get to customize it to your needs. Um, that's another part, the customization. If you think of the vision API is what it is, it has the, the parameters and the data that it has, and it's, you know, can tell the difference between a dog and a cat, but it can't tell the difference between your dog and your friend's dog. Um, Auto ML vision gives you this ability to customize, um, just to just show you really quick what that looks like without running it. You get a really nice console for uploading your own data. This is a model I created based on pediatric. Uh, X-ray imagery and uh, determining whether a given image has signs of uh, pneumonia or not. So there's 5,000 images uploaded, uh, 1,500 are, are labeled normal and 4,000 are labeled pneumonia. And you run through the, the tabs here. You, this kind of summarizes the sequence of operations. You import the data. You can inspect the images and modify the labels as needed. You can click train new model and that will take a while. It's not something you're going to do interactively, but it'll send you email when it's done. Uh, it'll give you some evaluation statistics like a confusion matrix and um, precision and recall and all that kind of stuff. And then you can actually test it by uploading images. I'm not even going to do this for time purposes, but I can take a um, collection of images upload them and it'll give me predictions in real time on the images that I send it. And 5,000 images is not a lot, but due to the value of this transfer learning where I'm kind of piggybacking off of a very deep and rich model, I actually get quite good quality on this, on this AutoML uh, database. One more I want you to know about is AutoML tables. The idea behind that is you send Google a set of a, a, a table of data, typically comma separated values and you define a target. And so the, the, the way this looks is similarly this tabbed view on the console where you upload data. One of the data sets I've been playing with is the, the Titanic passenger um, data. So you just hand uh, AutoML tables, this raw data in comma separated value text format. You pick one of the fields to be the target and train it and Google will essentially uh, run through a bunch of different models. It'll look at uh, gradient boosting and uh, random forests and decision trees and deep net, deep neural uh, networks and deep learning networks, all these different techniques. And it will find the best model for the data you send it. So I really like this tool because uh, it just, it makes life so easy for people who maybe don't have the background or don't want to necessarily dive deep into neural networks, but still to be able to benefit from the technology quite, quite easily. Um, this is just to show that AutoML is, is a real thing and is actually doing very well. This is a, a set of Kaggle petitions where um, uh, the, the AutoML, the team that, that was in the front running uh, used AutoML and actually did quite well against their teams that are using uh, human-based um, algorithms or building their neural networks. That's it for the content. I just have a bunch of um, uh, resources, which I'm not even going to go through other than to just tell you that this is the book I was referring to early on when I said there's a really great book uh, that gives a lot of the rules of the road for how to build, what are these heuristics that we use to build these networks. Uh, this one is by Francois Cholet, who is the creator of Keras. And so he's, he's a pretty formidable authority in this field. And it's just a beautifully written book. So I highly recommend that. Um, lots of things you can read about on your own, resources that I like, that I learned from. Uh, there's a free tier. So if you want to use Google Cloud, you can get $300 worth of credits for 12 months to use any of this stuff. There's a lot of stuff that's free without even signing up for the free tier. If you do the free tier, you have to give a credit card. There's some free stuff you can do without even providing a credit card. So I just wanted you to know about that. Um, and to close, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. It's Tim Berners-Lee who famously said, uh, this is for everyone about the World Wide Web. And I feel similarly about uh, cloud computing and machine learning and stuff. 
I think I feel like it's really exciting and really enabling technology, but we have to, it's really important for us to make it available and accessible and approachable by everyone, not just, you know, computer science wizards. So with that, I will end the talk and I'll be happy to take any questions. But as before, thank you for joining. Thanks to John, Joe, John, and Jennifer for inviting me. And I uh, hope that was helpful for you. Yeah, thank you very much for for um, all that the huge amount of content you've got, Mark. Um, huge amount of information, really useful. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we we definitely do have um, a couple of questions. Um, well, we've got a lot of questions. I'm going to try and pick out some of the um, some of the pertinent ones. Um, so I guess there's a lot of questions about um, neural networks, and as you'd expect, and um, some of the things you went through during the uh, using the note with the, the interactive session. So I guess um, I'm afraid, unfortunately, these are all anonymous, so I can't I can't attribute these uh, questions correctly. But um, one of the first ones is then, um, what's the purpose of an activation function? So the activation function is basically trying to make sense of the input. You know, you can imagine these, all these weighted values are coming into a given neuron and the activation function uh, effectively tells the neuron how to produce an output from them. And what you typically want from an activation function is something that's well behaved, that no matter how big the input is or how small the input is, it gives you a nice reasonable value around between minus one and one, for example. Um, for a long time, people used uh, an activation function that was sort of sinusoidal. It would it looked like an S. And uh, nowadays, we use this thing called ReLU in many cases because it has this interesting property of uh, it's the identity function for any value greater than uh, zero. So it is strictly increasing as you go from zero to one, but for any value below zero, it's zero. So it's this odd nonlinear function, but it, it uh, tends to give the, the network a lot of value in terms of finding the features of the input. Cool, thanks. Um, so you mentioned the dropout as a method to control for overfitting. Um, what are some other common methods um, to control for overfitting with neural networks? To control overfitting. Mm. Yeah, the typical way you'll find that you're overfitting is that the, uh, you're, you're looking at the progression of accuracy as the training cycle goes on. And what you'll see is it starts to get worse. Or you'll also see that it's decent and then it's ba getting bad for the validation data. It's going sort of backwards on the validation data. And so that's giving you a clue that the network is not generalizing. What you typically want to do is tweak things so that you get a steady, although um, reduced improvement over time, but a steady improvement with each epoch. And if you start to see the curve go down, 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 and then start to turn up again, it's telling you that you're probably overfitting your data. Makes sense. Um... So when you reach um, very high levels of accuracy with additional components, um, do you have any comments around the potential trade-offs in, in terms of interpretability? Uh, interpretability is really important, and I didn't touch on that at all in this, in this talk. Um, there are a few different techniques people are using, uh, something called Shapley, which is uh, sort of a way of varying the input and measuring how it affects the output to see what's um, you know, causing the result that you're getting. Um, I've seen some interesting demonstrations of this with image data where you'll get kind of a heat map that will tell you what parts of the input image were most uh, triggering for the result. Um, we're trying to introduce more interpretability as we go, and we have introduced some things. For example, that AutoML table thing that I mentioned earlier. Um, if you do make a prediction in the test and use column, um, let's see if I do an online prediction. So this is like some random person on the Titanic's data, and I selected the survival binary value as the target, and it built a model for me. 
and I think I say predict, and I'm gonna click on generate feature importance. And that's a little bit of explainability there because it's gonna give me a result. So up here it says, okay, this person uh, had an 8.872 probability of a survived value of one. So they had an 87% chance of surviving the Titanic. Um, but the local feature importance column is telling me what was most impactful on that result. So the 0 0.309 was the gender that had a big impact. The, the P class, I think that's the, uh, I'm not sure what the P stands for, but it's like the class, first class, second class, uh, stowage or whatever, <laughs> um, had an impact as well. So there were obviously economic factors on that. But um, that's just one example. The interpretability is really important, and we're we're working to to make some of these things more and more transparent in that domain. Yeah, thanks. There there is a lot of work going on with that. Um, I know from the um, the Google Next last November, I think some of the big announcements were around this new suite of tools and ongoing research around improving explainability. Yeah, there's a couple of really good blog articles from Sarah Robinson on on interpretability. Yeah, she's a fantastic Twitter follow. Um, um, yeah, so I think I think that's all the questions. Um, I apologize if, I, if I've missed any questions. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'll double down on the uh, on the book by Fran Francois Schwelle. Um, yeah, don't, it's been really really helpful for me. Um, Great. Yeah, and thank you, Mark, so much for joining us. Um, we'll make sure. Slides are shared afterwards. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, for, uh, for tuning in. Um, we'll be back next week for um, for our interactive code night. If um, you know, so come along if you got if you're working on a project, you're looking for some help, um, or you're trying to figure out how to, uh, where to go next with your uh, with your project. So you uh, or you're able to help anyone else out. Um, that's next Wednesday. Um, and yeah, we've got a, a lot of events coming up as well. So thank you very much.